Hi, hi, Portland. How are you all today? Ah! So um, my name is not pronounced Vidya Spandena. This, this is how it's spelled. So let's get that going. And it's pronounced Vidya Spandena. You want to give it a shot? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. So working in technology with a name like that, guess what I'm asked to talk about all the time? Any guesses? There you go. <laughs> Diversity. Um, I wonder why I get that topic. Maybe it's because I can get away with saying anything I want with a name like that. Um, or maybe it's because I don't really look like this dude. <laughs> I'll take it. But anyway, guess what? I am going to talk to you about diversity today. But not in that corporate, we need 19 different ethnicities <laughs> on our company website kind of way. <laughs> I want to change your mind on what diversity looks like. Diversity must be considered at the level of thought and perspective. We must go beyond defining diversity in terms of gender and race. Yeah. All right. So let's try something. Close your eyes, for reals. Take a deep breath. So now you're in the dark. Which, with a bunch of thoughts just sipping around, take a quick peek at what those thoughts are actually about. What are you thinking about? Here's what I'm thinking about. Actually, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> um, you can open your eyes. My point is it's completely insane in our minds. Isn't it wonderful that we have the freedom of thought to think about anything we want? But just imagine what it would be like if every one of those thoughts was controlled, put in place by somebody else. You don't get to decide what you think about anymore. You don't get to have room in your mind for funny, quirky, weird, sick, random thoughts. All there is is someone else's hopes and dreams, somebody else's frustrations, another person's likes and dislikes. What if your mind was controlled like this for the next 48 hours? What would that be like? What if you didn't have the freedom of thought for the next six weeks? You would be living in a kind of prison, wouldn't you? It is a prison. I'd know. I lived in that dark, choking, miserable mental prison for 10 years. My mind and my thoughts were so influenced that I couldn't have honestly told you what my favorite movie was. The people I'd hang out with, the hobbies I had, even the clothes I wore, none of them were truly mine. After high school, I spent about 10 years surrounded by a culture that regularly oppressed women and girls. A culture that believed that by definition, women were inferior to men. And by the end of those 10 years, I believed them. I believed that I was inferior, that I was worth next to nothing. I'd given up my mind to them, and I was considering giving up my life. Externally, I had the perfect life. My Facebook profile painted me as like the luckiest girl in the world. I had built a business that made millions. I had fancy houses, expensive cars, exotic vacations around the world. That was that life. But internally, this is what the landscape looked like. My thoughts and my perspectives were limited, homogenous, fearful, and honestly, pretty mean. For 10 whole years, I was trapped. 
in my own mind, a prisoner. Conditioned to act out the role of an oppressed, dark-skinned, weak little girl. This is what true lack of diversity actually looks like. The stifling of a human being's individual, unique thoughts. And this lack of diversity can happen in a group that looks like this. Freedom of thought could be constrained in a family that looks like this. My mental landscape back then looked a lot like what the landscape looks like today in our societies, our economies, and in our businesses. Let me show you what I mean. The most power in our country is not held by the top 1% of the population. Power in America is held by the top 0.1%. One third of the population of the United States produces less than 3.5% of the GDP. And more than a half the people in our work, work, workforce are women, yet less than 5% of the leaders of our top companies are women. A few people at the top making decisions for the rest of us. That feels a little too familiar to me. So there I was, 25 years old, with a 25-year head start to a midlife crisis. I couldn't continue living that way any longer, a member of the living dead. I was a real-life zombie. So I snapped. I lost it. I lost it all in the best possible way. So one day, I cheerfully waved goodbye to the security guards of my private estate, and I left. I left the empire I built, the businesses, the houses, all my possessions, everything was left behind for good. A few very strange hours later, I found myself in the care of about 15 Vietnamese nuns. Um, very compassionate and caring, they took me in without speaking a single word of English. I spent a few weeks with them in their monastery. And that, that night, lying in bed at the monastery, I had the first thought in 10 years that I could really call my own. Every single thought in my brain was a piece of junk. I needed a completely new mind. That moment of honesty marked the beginning of my journey from a life based in untruth to a life based on truth. That day marked the first day of a three-year journey around the world. Not to find myself was not eat, pray, love but to rebuild myself, to break down myself from scratch. And the very next morning I began, thought by thought, to actively bring in new perspectives, new ideas, new experiences. I opened my mind to life. One decision at a time, I began to diversify my thoughts. So I moved to a remote village in Costa Rica, teaching yoga to tourists and living on nearly nothing. I lived in a shack with 10 other people, a shack that had a leaky roof <laughs> and was not very safe. And I experienced poverty for the first time in my life, real poverty. From this was my house to this, my shack. And from there, I moved every few months, working random different jobs, studying, meditating, sifting through every single one of my thoughts, rejecting the ones that didn't serve me. I studied all over the world, eco-communities, and was a massage therapist in the highlands of Scotland near the North Sea. I shared an eight, a room with an eight-year-old boy named Nicky in London. He would be doing his homework while I would be editing short documentaries. He was the best roommate I've ever had. Um, he even let me have the top bunk. <laughs> and so months and years went by like this. I faced new fears, found new strengths, 
ended up across 10 different countries over three years. As you can imagine, my respectable Indian parents living in Silicon Valley were freaking out. <laughs> But my mind found freedom. It wasn't easy. These years were some of the darkest, scariest years of my life. These may sound like paradise vacation spots, but my reality was the opposite. Countless dark nights in Costa Rica, Pacific winter storms raging 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no electricity, no light, cut off from the rest of the world. The roads were washed out. The shack would shake every time lightning struck. And the howler monkeys would scream all night long. If you've ever heard a howler monkey scream, it is like death. It's the worst. And I couldn't sleep. I couldn't run away. I just had to sit there in the pitch dark, in my mental prison cell, and face it. I was thousands of miles away from my oppressed life. I was supposed to be in paradise, but I was still trapped. It took me months of countless nights like this to bring in lightness, to heal the darkest corners of my mind. Restarting your brain is an intense, transformative, painful experience, going from utter darkness to the dawn of light. So what does this story have to do with diversity again? Well, this is exactly what we have to do at the macro level to bring in true diversity of thought into our societies. No, I don't mean that we need to send everyone away to Peru hallucinating for 10 hours a night on a vision quest with a shaman. But for those of you who are interested, it's called ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is that we need to proactively seek out different perspectives. We have to go out of our way to encourage differences of thought inside of ourselves and in our communities. We must be curious about the 99.9%. And eventually, I found unshakable peace. I returned to the United States and began to work again in technology. And then one day, as I was leaving a meeting in the Pearl Cafe Umbria, the famous Cafe Umbria, I got a phone call. It was from the White House. So after all those insane, crazy experiences, getting a phone call from the White House was probably the, the top of insane and craziness. Um, it's, and, and they were offering me a job on top of it. I was recruited as a Presidential Innovation Fellow to use open data and technology to support economic growth in the poorest countries of the world. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. My three-year mental Jedi training, it wasn't my name or my gender, that helped me score this opportunity of a lifetime. All those diverse experiences gave me the strength and creativity to kick ass at one of the most challenging and rewarding jobs of my life, working for the President of the United States. <laughs> and finally, my sweet, sweet parents, finally they got it. They understood. <laughs> Years as a nomad, destroying my inner zombie, repopulating my mind, had finally paid off. Throughout this journey, one single poem played in my mind over and over again. 4,000-year-old Sanskrit words, or my, as my sister tells me to pronounce it, Sanskrit words. One of humanity's oldest call to the gods. Asatoma satgamaya, tamasoma jyotirgamaya, mrityonma amritam gamaya. This prayer now serves to remind me of my three-year journey, of how I saved myself from death, of how far I've come and how, how much farther there is to go. As surely as night turns to day, I know I will always venture 
into the unfamiliar and return with true treasure. And in that spirit, we're building a new school of technology here in Portland. A school that places diversity of thought and perspective at its heart. It is imperative that we build an inclusive community that provides opportunities for everyone to grow and learn. Early in my travels, I had one especially traumatic night. I had an epiphany. I was, it was a very violent night, and I was in a room um, by myself, just looking at myself in the mirror, tears streaming down my face, looking for answers, just anything. You know you have those moments. And it dawned on me that no one is coming. No one's coming to save me, to protect me. I only have myself. And this insight is fundamental at the macro level in our world today. No one person or company is coming to save us. No corporate quota program will magically increase diversity and inclusion in our societies and our economies and our technologies. If you were to take one message from my story, I hope that it's this. Get out. Actively seek out different perspectives. Diversity and inclusion must begin in your mind, thought by thought. Look for that little zombie inside of you and challenge it. Each and every single one of us has to step up. Thank you.